Love is a dagger. Just in case. Oh. Absolutely not. Daggers have always seemed to be Loki's weapons of choice throughout the movies, and this has actually been a slightly controversial point. Some of the fans regularly complained that the MCU insisted on having him use such puny weapons, while others just thought they provided for a really cool fight scene. The debate has been going on for years, and it was rekindled in the months that preceded the release of the Loki series. And it turns out that eventually the series did have a lot to say about daggers, and even put them at the center of two very important scenes, Love, Love is a dagger, is a dagger, and classic Loki's story. I take no offense, my friends, but blades are worthless in the face of a Loki sorcery. And in this video, I will try and provide an analysis of Loki's relationship with his daggers in both the films and the series. And in particular, I want to look at how the series uses them as a symbol for what I would call Loki's self-imposed limitations. Before we get started, this is your friendly spoiler warning. I will be discussing events from all the films in which Loki appears, and also the Loki series. And also a reminder that if you like this video, you can help me grow the channel by leaving me a like, or a comment, or sharing, or subscribing, or all of this at the same time. Now I want to start first by trying to answer the following question. Why does Loki even use daggers? As I've just said, Loki's habit of using daggers rather than magic has long been something that has annoyed some Loki fans. And that became even worse, of course, with Loki's death in Infinity War, and how stupid it all seemed. That Loki, who seemed like a powerful sorcerer who could use magic and illusions, decided to have a go at Thanos with a puny dagger. This was only the most egregious example of a larger problem, which was Loki's apparent unwillingness to resort to his magic instead of small blades, knives, daggers. Still, instead of just chalking this down to inconsistent writing, I think there could be an explanation that would make sense of all this. And I think this is what the writers of the series did brilliantly with the scene of classic Loki telling his life story. In my timeline, everything proceeded correctly my entire life until Thanos attacked our ship. So you, you didn't try to stab him? Uh, certainly not. But take no offense, my friends. The blades are worthless in the face of a Loki sorcery. They stunt a uh, magical potential. But they look awesome. Oh, yes. Especially when they clatter to the ground just before your neck is snapped. I cast a projection of myself so real, even the mad Titan believed it. So that scene, in my opinion, was brilliant writing because it did two things. It retrospectively acknowledged the problem of that death scene, and it suggested a possible explanation other than just bad writing. And the key sentence here is really, this stunt our magical potential. Classic Loki represents a Loki who has completely embraced his potential as a sorcerer and has developed it fully, as we see in the climax of episode five. And actually one of the things that would be interesting to find out is why classic Loki developed a different relationship to his magic. Something in his life before meeting Thanos must have been different from MCU Loki's life to explain why he developed his potential more fully and why he made a completely different choice in this crucial moment of his life. But regarding MCU Loki, we know that one of his characteristics is his self-loathing, which is very much the result of his upbringing in Asgard the way his adoptive father Odin set him up to fail, pitting him against Thor in a competition to be worthy, that Loki could never win, letting him believe he was destined to rule and lying to him about his origins, while also teaching him that frost giants were monsters and enemies of Asgard. And his family have always insisted that they did love him, which may well be true, but the one thing that he apparently never got from them, and which he really craved, was respect. We have to rely on crumbs for this because we see very little of his life before Thor's abortive coronation ceremony. But there are several hints in the first Thor film that suggests that Loki's abilities were never truly respected. We can assume from what little we see that Asgard tends to be a warrior culture in which the ideal of what makes a worthy man is to be strong, to be able to wield a powerful weapon like Mjolnir. But Loki's gifts are of a different kind. Loki is the younger brother. Not so much the football player, not the jock, not the muscle, not the alpha male. 
um, much more kind of in from the left field. His gifts are of the intellect and of magic. The problem is that none of these are particularly respected in Asgard, apparently. We see Thor and his friends, who are very obviously Thor's friends and not really Loki's friends, laugh at his silver tongue turned to lead. What happened? Silver tongue turned to lead. <laughs> so they make fun of his eloquence and in this case his failure to be convincing. Similarly, a deleted scene showed Thor being very dismissive about Loki's ability to use magic in battle. How else could I have fought my way through a hundred warriors and pulled us out alive? Uh, as I recall, I was the one who veiled us in smoke to ease our escape. <laughs> yes. Some do battle, others just do tricks. And yes, I know deleted scenes are not part of the film and I normally wouldn't use them in an analysis, but since we have so little to go by, I think this can provide useful insight into how this relationship was meant to function. Magic is often portrayed in fiction as a woman's weapon, something that's used by those who cannot rely on physical strength. And indeed, in the MCU, it was Frigga, Loki's mother, who taught him magic. Another deleted scene from The Dark World shows Thor and Frigga discussing Loki and Frigga explaining that she taught him her magic because he needed to have something of his own instead of being constantly in Thor's shadow. Do you ever regret sharing your magic with him? No. You and your father cast large shadows. I had hoped by sharing my gifts with Loki that he could find some sun for himself. Now we know from Loki's characterization that the main tragedy of his life has been his obsession with being Thor's equal and the fact that he never felt that he was treated as such. But having magic as a sort of consolation prize, that wasn't really good enough for Loki. What he aspired to was being able to impress Odin, being strong like Thor, being able to lift Mjolnir, the ultimate symbol of worthiness. So in my opinion, this can explain why Loki never seems to really use his magic to its full potential. It is linked to his self-loathing and the fact that he's pursuing an ideal that is not attainable for him. So instead of using his magic, he uses blades, which are more traditional weapons. But there are two obvious problems with this strategy. The first is that in any case, a dagger is hardly a noble weapon like a sword or a lance or a mighty hammer. And the second is that it's never a good idea to try and emulate the talents of others instead of developing your own talents. And therefore, Loki's record in fighting the MCU has been, let's say, not very convincing. Loki's fighting skills in the movies. Except when he's using more powerful weapons like Gungnir in the first Thor or the Chitauri Scepter in the Avengers, Loki's preferred style of fighting often consists of a combination of his daggers and his illusion magic. And while he appears to be a relatively capable fighter, it has to be said that it is rarely very efficient. Of course, the thing with Loki is, as he's either the villain or the anti-hero in the films, he almost never wins a fight. We mostly just see him getting owned. In the first Thor movie, he looks quite capable during the Battle of Jotunheim, and he does seem to match Thor's ability in battle while he's wielding Gungnir at the end of the film, but mostly because Thor refuses to fight him at first. And once Thor starts getting serious about it, it takes only one big lightning blast for him to dispel Loki's illusions. In the Avengers, in spite of having a very powerful weapon, he sure gets owned a lot. Yet it's hard to judge his efficiency, because with Loki, it's often hard to tell when he's truly fighting to win, and when he allows his adversaries to win because he has a plan. And in the end he gets Hulk smashed, not because he's not capable, but because he's careless. In Ragnarok, he takes out his daggers to attack Strange, but he gets completely owned, because Strange, unlike him, uses his magic. Then he uses them again to fight Valkyrie, but he loses that fight too. I'd say the only few times when he scores a big win in the movies are in the Dark World, when he manages to kill Curse thanks to his cunning. 
Granted, he gets skewered by Cus immediately afterward, but he survives, and it was pretty classy of him to manage to kill that big monster who was destroying Thor just a few seconds before. And then he manages to seize the throne using his magic by impersonating Odin. We don't see him do it, but still, that's a big win as well. So I'd say these are his two biggest wins in the movies, and they don't involve using daggers, but rather his true talents, which are cunning, or creative thinking, if you prefer, and magic. And whenever he sticks to using his daggers as his main weapon, and he only uses a little magic as a kind of support function, he's not that efficient. Now, what about the series? Loki's fighting skills in the series. At the beginning of the series, Loki is often prevented from using his magic when he's inside the TVA, because you can't use magic inside the TVA, and also his daggers, because the TVA took them from him. We didn't see how or when, but we know that because Mobius has the daggers in his locker. Here again we see examples of him using magic for rather silly things like drying his hair and clothes, for example. In Rock's cart, he has to fight the people Sylvie has enchanted using only his magic, since he has no daggers, they did not give him his daggers back. But again, instead of using his full potential, he only seems to use his magic to grab random objects here and there with not much efficiency. In episode 3, he steals his daggers back from B-15's locker, we don't see how he does that, and he uses them to fight Sylvie for the first time. Battle is inconclusive, but Loki is mostly interested in talking to Sylvie anyway, he's not really trying to kill her. Then on Lamentis, he actually uses his magic pretty efficiently when Sylvie attacks him, using teleportation and then dissimulation. But then very interestingly, Sylvie's pissed off reaction is to call him a magician, and he immediately pulls out his daggers as a response, like it's a reflex. So you're just fully a magician then? Fine, for my next trick... I'll make you disappear. And the exact same thing happens again in the other mining shack. It won't work. Why? Because you're a magician? No, because my mind is too strong. Fine. <laughs> Which comforts the theory that Loki clings to his daggers because he's ashamed of being a magic user. And this term, magician, is, is a derogatory one, obviously. It, it implies that he does cheap tricks to show off. It's not like a sorcerer. And clearly Sylvie does not mean that as a compliment, and Loki does not take it as a compliment, as shown by the following dialogue. And you call me a magician. The following examples of Loki using his magic are not very convincing either. He uses his illusion magic to try and trick the old woman and face dismally. And again to turn into a guard, but Sylvie has to intervene to prevent this from turning into a disaster. Then he shows her cute little tricks, but he's a complete disaster during the train fight as he's drunk and mostly inept with both his daggers and his magic. So basically, Loki's efficiency in the series is pretty similar to what we see in the films. He has this reflex of always going back to his daggers, and mostly uses his magic to perform little tricks, but nothing very impressive. A symbol of Loki's self-image issues. So the first message of the series about daggers is, they are probably not the best tool at Loki's disposal to succeed at what he's doing. But I mentioned that there were, in my opinion, two key scenes about daggers, and the second one is, of course, love is a dagger. Love is a dagger. It's a weapon to be wielded far away or up close. You can see yourself in it. It's beautiful. Until it makes you bleed. But ultimately, when you reach for it... It isn't real. Love is an imaginary dagger. It doesn't make sense, does it? No. Terrible metaphor. Damn! I thought I had something there. And I think this other scene completes the first one. It introduces the idea of the daggers being connected to Loki's obsession with his own image. When he formulates the love is a dagger metaphor, Loki says... You can see yourself in it. It's beautiful. I have already made a whole video on the themes of narcissism and self-love in the Loki series, 
so I won't go into details again, you can check it out by clicking this link, but this sentence clearly represents the dagger as a mirror. The mirror, or rather the reflection, is a key element in the myth of Narcissus. As I explained in the other video, Loki tends to be obsessed with the image he's projecting and the judgment of others, and this obsession is what prevents him from truly being himself and realizing his true potential. And it is also why love has remained elusive for him. As he explains at the end of his metaphor, it feels like an illusion. But ultimately, when you reach for it... It isn't real. Love is an imaginary dagger. And also, it's not true. You, you can't really see yourself in it. I've tried. Maybe just my, my dagger does not come with this option, but it doesn't work. You're gonna have to try harder than that. In fact, this whole idea that daggers are connected to Loki's obsession with the self-image that is in fact an illusion is also present in the other key discussion about daggers. When classic Loki points out that it makes no sense for a Loki to use blades instead of sorcery, and both for Loki replies, but they look awesome. Once again, the emphasis is on the idea of image. They look awesome. And it makes sense that this remark should come from boastful Loki, as he's one of the variants that represent the most toxic habits of a Loki. Uh, he's power thirsty, but he's also very concerned with appearing strong and cool and powerful. So it's not surprising that he shares this fascination with daggers and how cool they look. And clearly MCU Loki is also guilty of liking his daggers because they allow him to show off. He likes to flip them because it looks cool. A few questions. Let's see if I can do it. Oh, this is dangerous. Okay, it doesn't look as good with just one, but I own only one dagger. I don't have two daggers. So the daggers seem to represent Loki's obsession with his image, but that image is not in tune with who he really is deep down, and therefore this way of functioning needs to change for him to make any real progress. Love is a weapon? Another interesting thing about the Love is a Dagger dialogue is that in addition to being linked to the themes of self-image and illusions, it is also a very negative vision of love. Loki defines love as a dagger, and therefore a weapon, which cannot be a healthy view of love. Healthy love is not a weapon, it is something that nurtures, not something that hurts or kills. Healthy love is also not self-interested, it is altruistic, while a weapon is something that you use against someone else. And another thing which I haven't pointed out yet is that Daggers, well, they're not really noble weapons. They may be more traditional than magic, for sure, but if you think in terms of a warrior culture that puts a high value on physical courage and strength and bravery, then daggers are not going to be your weapon of choice. Daggers are associated with dissimulation, deception, cowardice. They can be thrown from far away, or they can be concealed in a cloak or in a boot. And a dagger is very much an assassin's weapon, or a traitor's weapon. And therefore they are associated with another one of Loki's toxic habits, which is backstabbing, and a tendency to betray other people. I never stab anyone in the back. That's such a boring form of betrayal. Loki, I've studied almost every moment of your entire life. You've literally stabbed people in the back like 50 times. We have never seen anything of Loki's behavior when it comes to romantic love, but when he defines love as a weapon, to be wielded far away or up close, it is hard not to think about his relationship with Thor. There are many jokes about Loki's fondness for stabbing and the fact that, in a way, this is how he expresses his love for Thor. He's always very stabby, stabby, stabby. We have at least two examples of that in the movies. There's this scene from the Avengers in which uh, Loki is visibly moved by Thor's plea, but eventually just snaps out of it and stabs him. <laughs> And of course the snake story from Ragnarok, and yes, I know it was improvised and there were some inconsistencies about the ages, for example, but still it fits the narrative pretty neatly, I think. There was one time when we were children, he, he transformed himself into a snake and he knows that I love snakes. So I went to pick up the snake to admire it and he transformed back into himself and he was like, yeah, it's me, and he stabbed me. We were eight at the time. There was that really hilarious comic which I found on 
uh, an old Tumblr page. It was probably about three or four years old. I won't be able to reproduce it. I will just give you the link because I, I would have to find the author again to ask permission. But it was a kind of head canon about the snake scene, and I thought it was brilliant. <laughs> it was something like Thor running to Frigga after getting stabbed by Loki, and Loki being like, "No, I didn't do anything." And Thor was like, "He still has the bloody knife in his hand." And then Frigga being like. Loki, did you do this? And he was like, no, yes. <laughs> and then Frigga goes, well, that must have been a very convincing snake. Well done, Loki. <laughs> and Thor just is just left there bleeding on the floor. And that was brilliant. This is totally what happened as far as I'm concerned. This is my official headcanon about what happened. So in practice, this love is a dagger metaphor is a very fitting one to represent Loki's own experience of love because it highlights Loki's problem with intimate relationships, which is that until now, his experience of love has been mostly one of betrayal. He was betrayed by those he loved, his family, who lied to him, and he has also betrayed them himself. I betrayed everyone who ever loved me. I betrayed my father, my brother, my home. I know what I did. Of course, this is not a healthy vision of love, which is indicated by Sylvie's reaction and Loki's admission that it doesn't really make sense, after all. It doesn't make sense, does it? No. Terrible metaphor. Damn! I thought I had something there. And yes, I know that you could argue that episode 6 confirms that this metaphor is in fact correct. It, it definitely seems to foreshadow what happens in the finale, with Sylvie kissing Loki, but then sending him away so she can kill he who remains. So yes, Loki is clearly hurt and sad at the end, and you could argue that once again, love made him bleed. But I would still argue that there is more to it than this. I don't think the Sylvie-Loki relationship is negative, and I'm pretty sure Loki, even though he seems shattered at first, will be able to see that this was something more than just a repetition of the same old patterns. So the metaphor is a very romantic one if you go by the literary meaning of romanticism, which focuses on love as a form of passion, meaning suffering and pain. But I think the series encourages us to distance ourselves from this vision of love too. It's not the ultimate message here that love really is or should be a dagger. Letting go of the daggers and of toxic habits. In a way, the series shows us Loki learning to let go of his daggers. The daggers are truly represented as a toxic habit for Loki, as something that he seems desperate to cling to as a sort of reflex or a need, even though it's not necessarily good for him. For example, look at his reaction when Mobius gives him his daggers back. It's almost like that of an addict. It's a deep sigh of relief. Just in case. Oh, Absolutely good. not. By the way, this mirrors another scene from The Dark World, when Loki's first request to Thor after being freed from his cell is to have his dagger back. You could at least furnish me with a weapon. My dagger, something. At last, a little common sense. And I think the train scene is really the moment when Loki kind of ditches his daggers and opens up to the possibility of a true evolution. Within a few minutes we see Sylvie dismissing the, that the love is a dagger metaphor, and Loki agreeing that actually he may have been wrong when he thought it was a good metaphor for love, Loki trying to use his dagger to help Sylvie and failing miserably, and then Loki being thrown out of the train, leaving at least one of his daggers behind. And this in fact is the last time we see Loki use his daggers. And it's probably not a coincidence if this is also the moment when he begins to behave more seriously and to show some respect for Sylvie and to try and fix his mistakes. And he even apologizes to her at the beginning of episode 4. I'm sorry. Which is something we had never seen Loki do before, except in the dark world when he was about to die. In the following scene in Shuru, he only uses magic, and this time not to fool around as he did on the train. He uses his green energy blasts more efficiently, and even more importantly, we have this scene, which is probably the most impressive display of his true power. And from then on, he uses two weapons, his magic, and not daggers, but swords. Swords are definitely an upgrade from daggers, because they are noble weapons. 
And also we don't see Loki just use any sword. The, the first sword he uses is Sylvie's sword in the Timekeeper's chamber. So this one symbolizes his new connection with Sylvie and how she trusts him enough to give him her sword and how this new relationship is helping him evolve into a hero. Then he uses Kid Loki's sword, which is even more interesting because it is a noble weapon. It's a sword. It's even possibly an ancestral weapon if this is indeed supposed to be Levitine from the comics. But it is also a magical weapon. It's a flaming sword. It's a burning sword. So it combines blaze and magic. There are various ways to interpret this. It could be a step towards Loki embracing his magic. It could also be the symbol of a synthesis between Loki's two sides, a weapon that combines a blade with magic. But this time the blade symbolizes his empowerment and not his limitations. And eventually the big win that Loki does score in the series is the enchanting of Eliath, which is a combined effort with Sylvie, of course, and involves only magic this time. And this is also an epiphany for Loki, who realizes that he probably has much more potential than he thinks. And in fact, this is something that Mobius told him back in episode one. I guess I'm wondering why does someone with so much range just want to rule? And in the alternate version of his story, MCU Loki's story after the Avengers, this is what Thor told him as well. I guess what I'm trying to say is that You'll always be the god of mischief, but you could be more. So in both versions of Loki's story, he has people telling him that he has more potential than he thinks, and if only he could let go of his toxic self-limiting habits, he could realize this potential. But the big difference, of course, with what happens at the end of the series, is that his experience with classic Loki and with Sylvie shows him that it's actually true. So to sum up, the love is a dagger scene and the classic Loki scene both use daggers as a symbol of obstacles to Loki's growth. His inability to give up his obsession with his own image, which prevents him from forming a real healthy connection to others, and his inability to embrace his true self and his true potential as a sorcerer. Then the moment when he stops using daggers coincides with a big turning point in the series, the end of the Lamentis episode and the Nexus event of episode 4. And the fact that he relies more on his magic and uses first Sylvie's sword and then Kid Loki's sword symbolizes all the important elements in his character's evolution. His newfound ability to connect to others, and in particular other Lokis, which is itself connected to a journey towards self-acceptance, and the possibility of turning into an actual hero rather than a villain or an anti-hero. And I think this use of daggers as a symbol of Loki's self-sabotage in the series is a great example of how the series managed to identify and highlight the consistency in Loki's characterization throughout his many appearances in the MCU. I'm not sure how much of this is retrospective consistency, because it could be that those who made the various films did not think all this through, but I do think that the series did a remarkable job at making all of this make sense, at, at tying everything together. Now, I do not know where season two will go from there, but it seems to me that season one has opened the door to Loki finally beginning to accept who he is, and therefore the next logical step would be to see him draw the lessons from classic Loki's tale and start relying more on his true talents, his magic, and his ability to think outside the box, which is the good side of his chaotic nature. Thank you very much for listening, and I see you next time. Bye bye.